Let me read a passage as I begin this last five minutes from Romans chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did this to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he called, not from among Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles." I believe the Bible teaches, Dr. Schreiner believes the Bible teaches, that God unconditionally elects, elects only some to be saved. He could choose all. This is one of the most staggering implications of the Calvinist view. Jerry is absolutely right to make this point. And, and to, try to try, try to say, can you accept this notion of a God who creates a world in which he intentionally creates people for reprobation? Any way you slice it, this is what it comes down to. He creates for heaven and hell from the very beginning. Well, and, and c can you say that God truly loves those whom he passes over and chooses not to save? I think you genuinely can. And I want to close with an illustration to show how I think you can make sense of this. This is a true story as I understand it. What, what it illustrates is how... There can be genuine love and yet choose not to save people whom you could save, people whom you genuinely love. In World War II, Winston Churchill had this tremendous intelligence device that was developed by British scientists along with help from others from the continent. And this device, I actually have seen one, it looks sort of like a typewriter, and they would decode Hitler's messages that he would send around to his frontline troops and... Uh, uh, and they call Churchill on the phone and give to him what Hitler's own plans were. This was called the Enigma. Perhaps some of you have heard about this device. Well, and, and of course, German subs and, and, and ger German uh, uh, military had these decoding devices all over the place, but now in Britain, they, had, they made their own, and so they were intercepting uh, Hitler's messages to his frontline troops. Well, one day, Churchill picked up the phone, and the folks who decoded the message told him this. In three days, Hitler is sending over a squadron of bombers, and he's going to bomb the city of Coventry, which is north of London. And, and so Churchill put down the phone, and he thought to himself, well, I'm going to call the mayor of Coventry, let him know that these bombers are coming, evacuate the city to save my people. But you know what? He never made that call. He never informed the mayor or the people of Coventry of this bombing that was going to take place in three days. Three days later, just as he knew, the bombers came over, crossed the English Channel, bombed the city of Coventry. Tremendous devastation. Many, many people died in this event. In fact, the mayor of Coventry called Churchill. I have seen a PBS special with film footage of Churchill walking the streets of Coventry, rubble all over the ground, bodies still laying dead on the ground. And, there, and Churchill is commiserating with the people over the death of these, uh, these British citizens. Now, here's the question. Why in the world did Churchill not save these people whom he could have saved? Would it be fair to say of Churchill, oh, he didn't love them. He loved the other people of England that he tried to save, but he didn't love them. Would that be a fair thing to say to Churchill? No, I tell you, that would be a cruel thing to say to Churchill. Why? Because the decision he made was one that was born out of a realization there is a higher purpose, a higher goal, which only can be accomplished if these people are not saved. Now, why is that? Why was that for Churchill? Well, it's very simple, that if these bombers had come over, you know, back in those days, they didn't shoot missiles from miles away. If these bombers had come over, sighted down, seen that the city was evacuated, guess what they would have concluded? They got the message. They must have been able to decode the message. They must have a decoding device. And Churchill judged that the war effort was of greater value than the salvation of these people of Coventry. I submit to you that it is reasonable to think 
that God is both loving of all people and selective in his love and saving grace towards some if in fact he has greater purposes that can only be accomplished by designing the world and carrying out his purposes this way. What is that greater purpose? Well, for Churchill, that was the war effort. For God, it is his glory, as Romans 9 testifies. May God be honored. Thank you. Jerry and I are going to split our time, and because Jerry is the more dramatic one, I'll let him have the second run of it. <laughs> I only have two things to say in response to uh, my friend Bruce here. Uh, first of all, is I, I continue to urge him and others to read beyond Romans 9. Romans 9 and 10 and 11 form a cohesive argument that need to be understood together. The second point I would make is I'd recommend that Bruce not use this illustration anymore because it works against him. Because what it suggests is that Churchill is like God. Churchill is not like God. <laughs> Churchill could not have prevented the knowledge of the enigma to be known. God could have prevented it. There's not an analogy between these two, and I'd recommend he think of another analogy to use. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, I, I would just reiterate that same thing. I mean, the whole force of the analogy is that Churchill, in order to save some, had to let others be lost. Is God under that kind of necessity? Does he have to have some people lost? And if he does, what kind of God is it that would have to do this to be ultimately glorified? That's the question. I mean, this is really it. I, I, asked, I said at the very beginning, the question here between us is, what is God's character? What is the nature of God's character? What kind of God would have a character that would require eternal damnation for him to be eternally glorified? That's the question. Now, uh, something was said earlier, uh, I also want to respond to that this statement that God doesn't owe us anything sounds very pious, but this strikes me as very much like a mother saying, I don't owe this child that I have given birth to anything. Now. A mother doesn't have to choose to have a baby, but if she chooses to have a baby, she's under certain obligations of love to care for that baby. God doesn't have to create a world. He doesn't have to create beings who care, who feel intensely, who have emotions and desires and the like. He doesn't have to create beings like that, but if he chooses to create beings like that, given his essential nature of perfect love, he cannot but do everything he can to promote their well-being any more than a mother could promote the well-being of her child. It's not a matter of what God owes us. It's a matter of his eternal nature of perfect love who willingly, gladly does this. And again, look at the cross and say, is the God you see revealed on the cross a God who needs to glorify himself by damning people eternally, people he could just as easily save with their freedom intact?